listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience, as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your host, former Prep Course Ops Superintendent and current Special Reconnaissance Training Guru, Trent Segmiller. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Ones Ready Podcast. You're in the team room here with Peaches, Aaron, and of course your favorite SR guy with the, um, you know, mediocre to good hair, Trent. So today we're going to talk about first, obviously, is, is the gratitude piece, the people that help us out. And if you look over at Aaron's shirt, it says Cardo Max on it. And you may be wondering, what is Cardo Max? And if it's early in the morning or if you need a little pick-me-up or if your immune system is feeling like it needs a pick-me-up, head on over to Cardo Max. And uh, put in the ones ready code, get a 10% discount, check out all the great stuff they have over there. I use it. Aaron uses it. I think uh, Peach is hoping it'll make him taller someday, but uh, we oh. haven't been able to break it to him yet. That, that's not what it does. Man. Shout to Cardo Max for hooking it up when I was down range too, so I just got back from a deployment. Finally, as you can see, shout out to Mac Cat Flags. I got that flag in the back as well. But Dude. Cardo Max, there was a whole box of stuff waiting for me, and they hooked it up when I was down range. It's awesome. So the Amino Boost was my favorite or the immune booster was my uh, favorite one. I'll throw that on my morning shake. So definitely dope. Thanks Carlo Max for all the support. Dig the shirt. Appreciate you. Oh, Sean Manson out there, freaking prior seal, you know, just sealing it up. Just crushing it. Wow. Wow. Seal puns. Like yeah, we'll, already, yeah, we'll we'll do seal puns all day long. I don't know. Oh my goodness! Hey, I, I'm just waiting for Sean to put out a book. I'm sure he will at some point. <laughs> That's I, I think it's part of the contract when you go anyway. Um, so we we thought we'd get together 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 today, and um and just talk about some of our experiences over the last twenty years. We know it's a hot topic and all this other stuff, and people keep asking like, hey. What do you think about Afghanistan? And we kind of were thinking, let's talk about all the good stuff uh, that we learned or, or lessons learned and things that we went through over there and then how that's going to apply to the future. Uh, so you folks out there that are thinking about joining, uh, you'll have a better frame of reference for what we talk about or our generation talks about when you get into the pipeline and as you move through your career and uh, and kind of know how to, you know, sift through some of the, some of the, you know, battle scars or whatever that we all carry and how to take the positive messages and the, the positive lessons learned um, and move forward from there. So that's, I mean, that's what I think we're doing today. I don't know what's actually going to happen. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, just, just a disclaimer here. We, we talked about it before we came on. Of course, we all feel some type of way about, you know, Afghanistan. Of course, you know, it's probably not all going to be positive, but all those opinions are out there. Like we share the same opinion as a whole bunch of our of our friends and guys that you know multiple deployments to Afghanistan of course there's a feeling of you know maybe the job wasn't finished the way that you liked or there's stuff that's going on right now that you don't agree with listen got it we have the we we feel the same way but everybody has those opinions right now so really what we want to do is we want to look at Afghanistan and go okay what did we learn how are we going to move out what does that mean for AFSPEC war what does that mean for where we're going in the future because that's the question that we got a lot is, hey, with this thing winding down and with deployments drying up and we're not going to go to the same places, maybe doing new missions, what what does that really look like? And where do you guys fall on it? So, Peach, I don't know if you had something to start off. Well, not necessarily um, with missions yet. I think I think that we'll hit that later on. But I so taking a look at what the good that came out of Afghanistan, Iraq and that kind of stuff. So I think one of the, the glaring things, and I'll, I'll quick get over to you is kind of a, a medical aspect, but like one of the things that drives medical innovation is not necessarily, yes, you have your, in, your universities and your medical facilities, your John Hopkins and stuff like that do, do phenomenal research and development and um, in the field of, of medical stuff. But when it, and man, I'm totally stepping out of my lane here. But, but when we talk about, um, you know, care under fire, trauma care, triaging and stuff like that, like the military is the leader in that. And it is conflicts and stuff like that that helps advance those medical, like there are medical procedures, if you will, when it comes to um you know, tourniquet placement and amputation and, and giving blood transfusions out in the field and that kind of blood stuff that, yeah. that yeah. is, I mean, probably 25 years ago. Well, actually even less than that, because we've only been doing blood transfusions for what the last 15 years, maybe. 
Yeah, I mean, really, 2003. So, you know, Roberts Ridge, the Battle of Takragar, that was kind of the watershed moment for we're going to start carrying blood out and whole blood, you know, whole blood uh, infusion and then buddy transfusion and, and stuff like that. But you're totally right. Pre-hospital care was revolutionized by, you know, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And even simple stuff that we look at now and we're like, well, of course, you know, I was, we, you know, eating dinner with a friend in Albuquerque and we were talking about their SWAT teams just now throwing tourniquets like as a, as a, a carry item for every single what? person. I, I know. Right. Yeah. Like it was just, like, they're trying to get it to the force wide and like, it's, it's really just starting like, Hey, these things need to be kind of like pushed out there. It's that's wild to us. You know, I have two tourniquets midline on my kit and always have, you know, and have <laughs> tourniquets that are in every bag that I can reach into. Usually the first thing that I can grab is a tourniquet. You know what I mean? But that, that's one of those pre hospital care items that is now seeped out into the, into the, you know, larger posture kind of across America as far as, at least as far as medic- medicine is concerned. And, you know, some of the innovation stuff you talked about too. When you talk about Reboa or some of these other like wacky procedures, they were like, I don't know, maybe that would work. Maybe if we occlude an entire huge vessel and stop the blood all the way south of like your hips, maybe that that would save somebody's life. Like some of those procedures and stuff were just born out of necessity. Like, hey, we need to fi- figure out how to how to fix this problem in the worst possible environment. And it came up with some great best practices, especially as far as you know medicine's concerned. So I think you're spot on there, although you are way outside of your lane. Oh. I'll be, hey, I was the first one to tell you that. <laughs> no, but I mean, you're dead on, you know, it did, it did drive a ton of, in, uh, you know, in innovation, you know, when you look at, you know, mass blood transfusion, you know, we have, we had, you know, people that would re- receive, you know, 35 units of blood, you know, combat trauma and through TXA, that's where we learned TXA reduces the amount of blood that you need for whole transfusion for a trauma patient like that. But that came out of the, the Sean, uh, his last name was Daler. I can't remember what it is, but it's the war and surgery in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was this huge trauma book that was published in like 2010. So, yeah, dead on though. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible to see. I mean, that's the stuff I'm talking about though, right? Like, so to us, it's crazy that SWAT's just barely catching up with tourniquets. But remember when we were all kids and like everybody said, if you put tourniquets on more than what, 15, 30 minutes or an hour, you're going to lose the limb. Uh, but we were... I think our community is so motivated to care about things like that, about, you know, the medical and the weapons handling and what works and what doesn't, um, that as people catch up to us, it's crazy that, you know, they didn't jump on all this stuff right away, but all those lessons learned kind of came around. Um, and, and not to get off medical, but I saw it during, you know, I wasn't around that much. And I want to eventually get over to Peaches to talk about the beginning of the war, not the this war, not the Vietnam War. Just settle down. Um but, but like when you'd go to shooting schools, right, like you'd see the differences. There was a lot of, you know, this is the only way to do the right thing in the beginning. And then like as it progressed, it's like, hey, no, well, if that works for you, it works for you. You know, there's like a, still a little bit of that, like this is what how, the proper way to do it, uh, but a little uh, less stringent on, on caring how you get the job done and just getting the job done and saving your own life as the, yeah. the war progressed. Yeah, that's my favorite thing to hear. And I've seen enough schools over the last, you know. 20 years or whatever that my favorite thing to hear any instructor is like, I don't know if it works for you. Like that's something that I've totally stolen. You know, the first I want to, you know, Hey, would this work? Cause people try wacky dumb stuff all the time. And I've been that young guy, like I'm going to run this mag upside down on my back so that when I'm in the prone, I could just grab it off my back and reload. Be like, Hey, you know how nobody does that. And you think you're the first person to innovate this new thing. It's cause everybody tried it and it doesn't work, but cool for it. However you want. But I, I love when you bring up these wacky ideas and the instructors are like, I don't know, maybe that does work. Because some of the best instructors that's, I've had, you know, they're, they're like, I don't know, maybe that pretty. would work. And you find, yeah, you find some new way to do it. Yeah, innovation. I mean, it's it's cliche, you know, but that's what we're looking for. And, you know, times of taking it back to medicine, I mean, that's that was born out of necessity, you know, now, and how many, how many iterations of different tourniquets have we gone through now? And, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I've got, you, you talk about, you know, people are just now starting to carry them or we've been carrying them for years or stuff like that. I mean, I've, I've got two tourniquets in each one of my cars with a face mask because I don't know if I'll ever need, I'm sitting here, like I've gone down this road so bad that I'm sitting here 
thinking like, okay, well, yeah, all right, I'll be able to put tourniquets on somebody, whether it's two limbs or whether I need, you know, they lose one limb and I need to put two tourniquets on. But I'm sitting here also thinking like, okay, well, do I need a, a needle D as well? You know, there could be a chance that I possibly you need that. Go, you're just going to Target, dog. Like you're not going, like it's not Somalia. You're just going. Have you you're been just... to Washington State? <laughs> That's a good one. The State Fair is in town this weekend, so maybe, <laughs> maybe you're going to need that time. I might. I think Aaron's saying no needle, needle decomp unless you're going to Walmart. I think that was a, a Target versus Walmart comment. Yeah, that's, it. that's exactly it. You're, you're such a classist. I, well, I'm sorry. You're not going to need an IPAC if you're going to Whole Foods, dog. Like, it's not the, it's not the same. But, yeah, I, I think we learned a lot of good things, especially you know, from Afghanistan. When you talk about mission planning and stuff, uh, I think some of the unintended second and third order consequences – these huge problems, because um, we really do like, well, and when I say problems, I mean, you know, these huge things that we have to solve, these huge rock, rocks that we have to break, they don't really seem that big anymore because now we all have experience with, I don't know, let's take the entire unit and go deploy, you know, in, in a heartbeat. And that's kind of how this whole thing started off. So, you know, Peaches, in the regards of, you know, logistical chains and figuring out these things, like how much different was it? You know, when this thing first kicked off, because you were there right in the beginning. So how, how different are we now as far as organized and tripped and, equi- you know, equipped and trained for the fight and, and all that other stuff? Because you were there when this thing kicked off. Like, it had to be, like, phones ringing, pagers going off, I assume, at that point. <laughs> you guys it was pagers. It was yeah, pagers. I, it was. I, I had a pager at the same time, man. It, 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 it. I, just a quick tangent, man. I had a pager with voicemail. That was the dumbest thing of all time. Like somebody would somebody would legit call my voice like this mailbox. They would leave a message, and then I would use my phone to call and get the voicemail. It was the worst. It was just leave the number in the pager anyway. So what was it like on those uh, those early days, man? Well, I mean, so there's a bunch of different routes you could go down, but like let's just you brought up equipment, so we'll talk about equipment. Um, I mean, I'll have to post some some pictures from you know, the equipment that, that we were carrying. But I mean, that at the beginning, not that many people were wearing body armor, right? Like that wasn't a, a standard issue. You've got to go like everywhere. Now you're, you're not leaving the wire without wearing body armor. It's just, and it's weird. Yeah, it's exactly like, even now it's weird. It's, it's, you know, you're kind of like, man, I'm going to go do this SR mission. Why am I wearing body armor? Some of that's just being overprotective, and I think we're going to start getting away from that. We're going to have to start getting away from that in the in the future fight. But, um, like, you know, it, everything's all integrated now. You have, you know, your LB, your load-bearing equipment that is integrated into your body armor and stuff like that, and it's one singular unit. Whereas when we first went over, we are wearing plates, but then on top of it, we were wearing an LBE, and usually they were different colors, like the body arm would be black, and then we have woodland camo, and it was just, yeah. you know, on top, and we're, we're wearing desert, you know, DCUs and stuff like that. It's just, it, we've definitely gotten a lot more professionalized, and that's, and that's just like the, the way it looks. black uh, elbow and knee pads, like, you just look, man, it was just, you looked, it was a green chocolate chip sort of light pan mess yeah I'm just like what do you just stuff hanging up guys would like sew patches or sew like pouches and stuff on because they'd be like oh this works better so you'd have guys with completely like personalized kit but it was like a one-of-a-kind deal because it wasn't being mass produced it was just for them yeah but i mean like okay so take weapons for example you know different handles on weapons different we all we all had the the really bad standard issue mags that would always jam then h and k came out with these really nice mags they were heavier but they worked really well and then you know now we're everybody's running p mags and stuff like that and then you had the optics you know eotech wasn't a thing at at that point i think if i remember right i think aim point was but um eotech wasn't a thing and that didn't come out until i don't know i think oh three or something like that so um which that was a game changer then and now everybody i mean now things are just you know that's just on the gun you know your forward hand grip that's that's different and changed now you know a lot of people weren't running that at the time or if they were it was that you know massive handle coming down and it's just so there's been a lot of weight loss in terms of equipment there's been a lot of gains in terms of functionality and then um i mean look at look at the tactics that we're we're starting to do now um 
that we didn't use before as well. Like it would never, it would have been a big deal or a big train up if you were going to go do live fire in a house or you were going to go do live fire immediate action drills. But now, you know, you do some dry iterations, you do some sims, and then you're rolling right into live, but it's not as big of a deal. That's the standard, you know, and and we were doing back at the 321st under old CA, you know, me as a very young guy, that was his standard starting right away. It was like, hey, you know, the jig is kind of up here. This is where we are, you know, as a as a war fighting entity and then us in the career field. Like, this is what you're going to be expected to do. So we need to train to that standard. And it would kind of blow my peers as, you know, ha- hair back, to, so to speak, because we'd be like, yeah, no, we went on this big train up and we went live pretty much right away. And it was exactly that. It was we're going to walk the house for a little bit. We're going to go dry. We're going to get nice and slow. All right, we're going to go to Sims. All right, good. We're going live. And we'd be live for the rest of the week. And that was just the standard. And sometimes it was really slow, like painfully slow. But we were just live all the time. It was one of those things that that's the standard now. You look at it now and you're like, that's that's where you got to be. Because those, those are the problems that we've already figured out how to, we've already figured out how to solve those. And that's kind of like why I like that we're approaching the Afghanistan angle uh, the way that we are is because I want to look at those things that we've figured out. If we need to go on those direct action, we've got direct action figured out from Intel development to tracking to planning to execution. We we do that pretty well. And when you look at like the Ranger Regiment, you know, most high value uh, kill capture, you know, in the history of warfare, like those guys, you can point them at that problem set and they're going to win. Yeah, I mean, but like in the beginning, you know, they're, they're a lot of the lessons that we learned, right, was how to slow down, how to uh, not just rush into things, how to, you know, like, because I think, I, I mean, I wasn't there in the beginning, but I, the, it seemed like the mindset that we had was a little uh, aggressive all the time and, and, and not and not giving the uh, the other guys a, a credit for being, you know, wily and, and, and figuring out how to, you know, figure out our TTP. So, like, uh, you know, I think we lost a lot of guys rushing into places and all that other stuff. Uh, but just like the call outs and the, the bangers and everything else like that and slowing down. Um, I, I, I think the what happens is that you're forced to confront, you know, you're forced to, to develop a little bit of patience and humility. Uh, because I think when we first got in, went in there, it was kind of like, you know, I, we heard it on the weather side, like, oh, it's the desert. Like, why do we need cold weather gear? And, you know, like, and then it's like, oh, they're the they're people that live in caves and they're whatever. Like, we can just go schwack all these people and do whatever. But uh, the, the reality of the situation forced us to, uh, you know, not only change our equipment and the way that we do business, but also I think our mindsets to a certain extent and, and understanding, um, you know, what the other people are capable of. And, and bullets don't care if they're fired from some dude that lives in a cave or, or you know, the most highly trained, you know, tier one operator on the planet. Yeah, it, um, it, it gets cold. It gets real cold. <laughs> what? It's, I'm just gonna it's really good. We'll say we from flying. from experience. We were uh, so I, I did uh, a winter rotation. So I was at, I was at Bagram and we were going somewhere up in the northwest or northeast, I guess. And uh, it was the coldest 47 flight I've ever taken. We like we flew through it, through the pass, and ain't no heat on that bad boy. And it was in the <laughs> middle of the winter as it was. So first of all, you're terrified because you're flying through the pass in Afghanistan in a helicopter that. Those, those those things tend to get shot down and then you're just like okay cool it was freezing freezing and i don't know why but i was not ready for that event <laughs> about halfway through i was just like i don't know how much time i got left like i, I think it's going down here. It's probably my fault but I'm going to do <laughs> can i can i just, it was just absolutely freezing. can i side note a movie real quick we watched the, the outpost the other day and at the end of the movie i liked the movie at the end of the movie they're flying out on a 60 and the shot is they're like, you know, 8,000 feet above the mountaintops in a 60 False. with the doors open False. and they're just like chilling. And then they can also like they're talking to each other and they can, they're just looking at each other and it's fine and everything. And I'm like, hey, by the way, where they were, that 60 is barely making it through those mountain passes to get to where they were. You know, like, yeah, I, could you see the string for whatever other better aircraft was like the 60 <laughs> or did they get do a good job of hiding it or because the 60 ain't flying up there, dog. Yeah. Out. You said 8,000 feet. I was already just like, no, well, 8,000 feet where? How? You know, it, it doesn't do that, especially Fat Wendy, the new one. Oh, oh my God. 
It's like, oh my God. it was like Scott Eastwood's face and then the mountains like way below them. I'm like, that's not how that works. Those mountains are huge that and they're freezing. Have to trust me. Sorry. I just, <laughs> of all the things that got to me in that movie, that was the one. That was the one thing. I love that. I love having completely irrational things that make you hate entire bodies of work just for no good reason. Oh, really? That high with the doors open? Nah, bro. Zero. Turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> but, Trent, you, you brought up a good point with tactics. I mean, you you brought up call-outs and stuff like that. Right? Like that. I mean, that was a thing, but it wasn't as big of a thing now. Now it's kind of, you know, standard. And, and then look at all the advances in... Um, small UASs or small unmanned aerial systems and, and stuff like that. I mean, the cameras on those, well, the fact that we even fly them now is a big deal. And then the cameras on them and their capabilities, and now you can attach speakers to them. And then you hand, you know, the mic over to the translator and then he can speak directly to them. And then you want to start talking about dogs. And I'm, I'm, I'm being very vague and kind of just, hitting these wave tops because I don't want to dive into TTPs and then all of a sudden I, you know, bust some kind of classification, but like those, I hope you do. Yeah, that would be <laughs> really break, good. I hope we break it here. I'm doing the same thing. Like we were integrated, <clears throat> we were integrated into a uh, base defense and we had a specific piece with our UASs. And I was trying to think of a way, like, is there any way that I could talk about that <laughs> without getting into tactics? But if you want to go ahead, um, would you I'd supposed love to see to, you go down for it? Yeah. Well, it's been it's been nice working for you at the squadron. So, yeah. <laughs> His rank can handle it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mine won't. They'll just kick me out. <laughs> him. He's a legend. They'll, they'll let him get away with just like a slap on the wrist. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> you kidding me? There's people just waiting for me to mess up so they can pounce just in here. <laughs> waiting in the background, yeah. like. Wah. <laughs> But uh, okay, so yeah, we we talked about tactics and all the the advances in tactics, and and I think that that's, um, and I know I break up the weapon school all the time, but that's that's the whole reason why the weapon school existed when it was was founded was because all of these uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that were learned during war um, were, were well, kind of be lost as as guys kind of retire, transition out. Um, and there wasn't another conflict for those guys to carry on those tactics. So, or those TTPs. So that's why the weapon school is important. That's why for us, it's important now to make sure that we don't just kind of fade off into the sunset, that we continue like, and the way we're good at it, continue to train the people that are, um, you know, new to the team, because if we don't, then we're just screwing them we're screwing the mission and we're screwing America in general by not making sure that they're ready to go. Yeah. Well, and that brings up a good question and try and I'll throw it to you is, you know, where are we going? How do you, cause what peaches is saying is, you know, we want to remain relevant. We want to remain, remain good at the things that we're already really good at, but we want to take on these new, these new mission sets. And we were talking before we got on, that's a pretty common question that we're getting is, okay, so what did we learn from Afghanistan? It's time to move on to something else. You know, what is that something else? And sometimes we see it as funny questions in the DMs that are like, am I still going to be able to kick in doors, bro? Like, that's funny. But, you know, really, it's where where are we going? Where where do you think SR finds a home post-Afghanistan and post g I mean, that's it, it depends, right? Because we always tell people they're, they're, if something pops off, we got to go no matter what. But I think. Big picture, right? I think uh, it's no secret that everybody's focusing, and it's not just SR, it's everybody's focusing on that near peer uh, environment. And, uh, and I wanted to say something on the humility piece as well. I think as, as our generation, if we want to call ourselves out or our generation out, one of the things that is going to be difficult for us is after 20 years of experience in a certain type of fight, adopting that humility as we talk to the young people coming up who probably understand the new systems and the new way of going about business or the way the way we're going a little bit better than we do. I think um, uh, adopting that 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 mindset and remembering back in the, you know, back in the early days when some of the stuff that we tried didn't necessarily work very well because it was based on old tactics. Uh, I, I think that's the big thing is, is it's not really up to me where it goes. It's up to the young guys, you know, like we can direct it. Um, uh, but like at the tactical level, uh, making sure that all, all of us old farts are, are, you know, we obviously have great experience. 
but like adopting that that humility mindset to like let the young guys move out and move forward and 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 open up their aperture so that they can find the solutions for any of the problems that we run into whether it's you know more of the uh, stuff that we've been doing uh like in uh, the the big continent or whether we're you know hopping some islands or doing other things in other places and 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 playing uh, uh electronic warfare games or or whatever um but yeah that's that's just me. I, I think that's that. That's where the wall is because after something really big like the the Iraq Afghanistan thing ends, like we're all going to hold on to it for the rest of our lives, right? And I'm a slave to my experiences just like anybody else. Uh, but I don't want to hold the next generation back from uh, you know moving out as quickly as possible and learning the lessons for themselves. I'm not sure if that answered your question at all. I just kind of went on my own rant. Yeah, I, I like it. You're like, I understand the question, and I'm going to answer it uh, with these words that have nothing to do with the question. In no way did I, you I like answer it. that question, and In we no are way. all dumber having listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, may God have mercy on your soul. No, it was a, I, like, I like the answer that you gave, right? Um, because I, I do think that you're totally right. You do have to, we have to get out of our own way. And I've seen it from both sides of the fence now. We will be the first people that will look at like the general air force and we'll just be like, you need to let us innovate. We need shorter decision chains for all of these things that I want to do. I don't think there should be all of these overarching processes. Like if it's the right thing to do, we should be able to do that right thing right now. So we'll say that on one side and then on the other side, you know, we're the first people to look at the young guys and be like, listen here, young guys, you don't know what you're talking about. We do things this way because it actually works. Like we're very much more rigid than you would think. You know, and I've seen it from both sides to to where you need to, to let the new guy on the team, just let them innovate. Just give them the task and say, hey, go figure this thing out. Give them what they need to figure it out and look for the end product. I always tell the guys, I am more a what guy. I'm not really a how guy. I don't care how you get this done. I just want it done. And I don't want to have to like give you a ton of input. I want to tell you, go do project X. I don't need a whole bunch of questions. Get it done. Please make it as fast as you possibly can, as good as you can possibly do it. And let's move on to something else, you know? So, and I think, you know, the young guys need to innovate that. And, you know, Peaches, you can speak to the global access piece, but there's dudes figuring out near peer, great power competition solutions to problems we didn't even know we had. And it's because the younger dudes, the Gen Z's are looking at it completely differently than you or I would. Yeah. I mean, just to, to hit that real fast, like I, <laughs> That bugs me, the, the whole innovation thing. I just, we have to, uh, we have to be okay with allowing people to fail. We, we get this mentality and, and hey, I'm guilty of it too, is, you know, I will not fail. I will not fail and make sure we'll win and make sure it'll be a mission success. But the problem is that, you know, that's where we fall in that rigidity because we, we know that X, Y, and Z ensures mission success or ensures no fail. Um, so we don't really give the new guys a chance to learn, innovate. We just go, Hey, this is, this is the equation to make sure that you get to success and don't deviate from it. So we have to be okay with a failure or okay with something that doesn't necessarily, that is not perfect, you know? Um, that's just my point of view. I, and I'm probably bad about allowing that to happen as well. I, like I just, I fall into that trap. So I'm definitely guilty of it. But uh, regarding global access, I mean, it, moving into strategic competition, it is going to be, global access is going to be larger than it has in the past. Yeah, we've got, you know, people landing on dirt strips. We've got, you know, um, A-10s landing on, highways in um, Estonia and that kind of stuff. And I, th I think we even started doing it here in the States too, I believe. Um, not that we haven't landed C-130s on, on highways in the States anyway, but um, I think those kind of things are going to be uh, more important now is finding locations on highways to, to land versus dirt strips. Um, we, we noticed it here with, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, like, no, for some reason, everybody thought or everybody forgot that airfields are extremely important. You know, I mean, I mean you know, so we just wild. I, I know. Wild, wild. Like and looking back on it now, you know, it's, it's weird when you have a little bit of distance from a problem. Looking back on it, I can't believe all of us didn't look at each other like, hey, we're giving BAF up. 
is that a is that a good <laughs> is that a uh, is that a great idea? Like, but looking back on it now, you're like, holy cow! I can't. Like looking at the timeline, you're like, why would we ever do that? You know, I was, I was having a conversation with one of the dudes, and I was like, you know, I've I've been to Bath like three times or something, two or three times in and out of there, and uh, each time I was like, wow, this is a strategically, you know, pretty pretty well set up. Like it was Bath and Kandahar for the longest time. Bath and Kaffir, the biggest, really the two biggest bases. Um, you know, outside of Bastion when it was open, but well, I couldn't believe it. Couldn't, uh, couldn't believe how we, uh, kind of just gave Baff up right away. Anyway, yeah. uh, anyway, going down that route, yeah. but, going but down, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. airheads, you know, you know, yeah. airfields, they have strategic, they are strategic assets, you know, you have to have them, um, whether, and I don't necessarily mean, oh, you got to jump into them or whatever like that, but you have to be able to get people in. You have to be able to get logistics, supplies, um, fuel, weapons, ordnance, that kind of stuff. You have to get that stuff in. So getting access to to certain areas is extremely important in strategic competition. So if you think that global access is going away or it's not necessarily sexy, when you're, you know, two dudes or a dude and a dudette or whoever out there, you know, kind of alone and unafraid uh, setting up an airfield, that nobody knows that that's what you're doing. Like, I mean, I'm sorry, maybe I'm that's partial, cool. but that, I think that's kind of cool. Well, I just did it for a deployment. It was awesome. I didn't do that specifically. That wasn't me doing it. Cause I was the nerd setting all this stuff up and the teams got to go do this stuff. But I, I, people kept asking me, you know, Hey, how was the deployment? You know, you're a, a PJ enlisted dude doing the, the global access deal. He's like, you know, we were, we were super bored. I told everybody the same thing. I had never been more challenged. I had never had more, you know, uh, fun and was able to figure out like exactly how we were affecting the mission. And we got after some very, really, really cool things like things. And of course we had the normal stuff go on. Like there was a mass casualty that some of my guys were able to positively affect. And there were some really big things that we ended up doing that were, were good. That gave me a lot of, a lot of mission accomplishment, but it was on the, the global access side of the house. I just, I'm telling, telling people left and right, like our direction, like where we're going with the access mission and how we're going to get after some stuff. I'm excited to see where it goes. Like I want to stay in ST because of where that's going. I I think it's going to be awesome. And it's a really complex mission set to get after. It's got some really hard problems. And I I think one of the, one of the coolest things about mission sets like that is you're you're out there and you you have a, a mission set, but you're also building relationships and solving those problems. And for for people thinking about getting into this uh, this community, like I've never like my last rotation out there doing that stuff. Like you find one problem and you fix it and you build relationships, which spawns like questions, which spawn more problems to solve, and it just it it recipro- you know it just keeps going. Yeah. And so there, there's nothing static about it. There's nothing boring about it from my perspective. And I think it's it's incredibly important. And, and I mean, maybe we're just old and we just love solving problems and, and looking at things in a certain way. But I, I, I mean, I had a really good time doing that. This, yeah. yeah. Well, so, all right. So we've kind of hit the global access part of it, but and and I know we can we can dive into some of the advancements in personnel recovery and stuff like that. I mean, I, I know I I can go into precision strike and we can hit that after the personnel recovery part, but um, like, what are some of the advances that you've seen in personnel recovery, Aaron, but also, Oh, do you, Oh, do you have something? Yeah, actually thinking, thinking back to cold weather gear and all that, I did PJs exist before Arcteryx or how did that? How dare you? That, how dare you ever bring that dead bird gang up in this forum right now? The how nerve. The nerve. The nerve. Why I never you'll have to go to the YouTube to see this, but I'm clutching my pearls as I say that. I don't never. So the PR the, the big the big move in PR is is completely aligned, especially talking about the, the ST side of it, right? Like the big move in personal recovery is getting to that no kidding, contested, denied environment where you can't send a, you know, you may not have GPS, you may not have the ability to talk outside of it. It's creating mesh networks between us so that we can talk to people and then finding ways to get data bursts of information out. And really talking about that, you know, when we had Chief Smith on, that intra-domain cross-theater sort of operation, right? Finding a way to get to somebody 
um, that's completely, you know, no kidding, hardest problem set. Like you're not flying in, you're not jumping in. Now what are we going to do? How are we going to get there? So I thought, uh, you know, the integration of, of PR and all these things is, is awesome. And just like global access, this stuff has to happen way before the event, way before the event. You have to, you know, setting everything up, you know, left of bang. And that, that includes training, you know, the air crew members or the soft operators or whoever might be the people that are isolated, you know, training them some field craft, how to avoid capture until they can get to an area where we can get to an area like that takes a lot of training from both ends of the spectrum. So thinking through those problems, it's everybody can say, okay, well, we're just going to barge in there, you know, guns blazing. We're going to scoop this guy up and we're going to leave. And that's what personnel recovery looks like sometimes. Yeah. But I I think where we're going now is going to have to be a much more nuanced, much more developed PR plan. And I, you know, the, the left of bang aspect of it, that's when I start getting really excited about problem sets. Because that's when you start opening up those layers and you're like, well, what does this really mean? How would we really get a team there? How would we really get into this area? What would we need in order to make this no kidding happen? Like if we really wanted to do it, because you can whiteboard stuff and you can talk, you know, crap in the team room all day. But when you start really laying down plans and contingency plans, it gets complex really, really quickly. So, um, you know, as far as where, where does PR go, it might look, you know, something completely different. You know, it might be, you know, more integration with host nation and partner forces and and one or two dudes that can make a handoff here or there. And, you know, there are some really, really intricate things that, that can go on. But, you know, trying to solve those problems was challenging. Um, so I, that's thanks for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> I was thinking for, the exact same for thing. PR. Thanks for coming to my <laughs> TED talk. Have a great day, everybody. That's, that's what I think about <laughs> PR in the current environment. But, I, but I'm excited because PJs get to do stuff that I, I would never dream of. Like, never dream of. The, the positions that I put my PJs in to support Global Access as last deployment, you would never dream of it. All kinds of opportunity to be a hero. All kinds of it. All I need is a hero. Cue the music, baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there, there's so many, so many different opportunities that don't look anything like you know, go back 10 years. If you look at some of the, some of the PJs that have, have retired in the last 10 years, if I looked at them and said, Hey, we're doing this now, we're going to this school. We've got this capability. They'd be like, no way for what, but it's, it's where we are and it's where we're going. It's it, I'm again, I'm always an early adopter, but there's things that we're going to be able to get into in the next 10 years to support this next coming fight. That's, it's going to be a big deal. And people are going to, you're, you're barely going to recognize ST and, and PJs. Well, yeah. I mean, it, you, you look at it, it's amazing just to look at what we were two, three years ago. Like, I mean, it's just a constant evolution. It really is. I mean, you, you, if we stay stagnant, then we become, you know, irrelevant. We, oh, yeah. we have to remain tactically relevant and strategically relevant in, you know, not just what is currently going on, but also the future. And which means that we, you know, every two years, or, you know, it's not set two years, but like you can just look back two years ago and you go, okay, some things we're doing the same, some things we are not, and we have a completely different vision. That's why whenever people bring up the the special tactics 2030 vision, it's like, well, yeah, we, we have deviated in a lot of different places with that. Some of them, yeah, we're right on track and we're going that way. Yep. But others, it's like, yeah, man, that's, you know, we adapted because that not the document itself, but like ST special tactics aspect war is a living, breathing thing. And we have to constantly evolve. Well, the world is too. You couldn't go back to when that 2030 vision was written. We didn't know that we weren't going to have Afghanistan. We didn't know that we weren't going to have some sort of troop presence in, you know, different countries across the nation. We didn't know that the CVEO threat would be what it is. We didn't know that great power competition and like we can forecast these things, but as those assumptions change, you need to change your plan. So not only is ST and the 2030 vision a living, breathing thing, but the world, the geopolitical environment, the need for military and soft forces is always going to change. It's going to evolve and you're just going to have to flow with it. So yeah, it's frustrating. Like I get like the frustration with people that are just like, oh, when's the 2040 vision coming out? We're almost to 2030. Like somebody <laughs> made that joke the other day, but like they're, you're not wrong. I'm writing it right now <laughs> as we speak. All right. Uh, just tell us all the tactics and get yourself in trouble. We're trying to get two OPSEC violations on the show for you. I'm trying to free that schedule up. 
because <laughs> I need more work on ones ready. I would say you're just uh, you're just trying to uh, get me fired so you can hop up into my job. That's <laughs> that the furthest. That that couldn't be the furthest. From the truth. <laughs> yeah. I don't want it. I think uh, one of the things that's been happening over the last like five years, though, as as all the career fields kind of come together more than more than we did in the past. I think one of the things that it, like looking back at the beginning 20 years ago, pararescue, combat control, you know, Sauti, TACP, we were all very alone doing our own thing with our own customers. Like we interacted when we had to, but I don't think there was like a, a combined vision uh, left to bang all the way up to like strike and recovery. And I think that's one of the big things that's, that's happening now is the integration of everything based on the, the requirement for that, based on the, the, the current environment, you know what I mean? Um, to have all those things integrated into a, a, a more single space. Uh, and I think part of that is just we, we're all together more than we used to be. Uh, but part of it is as we look at these problem sets, you know, if I'm not considering the, the what the SEER guy has to say and the pararescue guys and everything else, and if we're not looking at uh, all the considerations required for a strike in this new environment moving forward, um, you know, and, and, and making sure that everybody has all the data they need, you know, I don't think we're going to be successful. And I think, to me, that's that's what I see over the last, you know, five, ten years is, is all of us coming together and working together and, and meshing a lot and, and working on kind of the same things, but also uh, taking all of our strengths to, for a single purpose more than we used to. Feels good, doesn't it? Uh, Feels good to be back in one team room. Yeah. I, I was in the, the two team room days. I didn't like the two team room days. No, I, I think you're totally right. You know, I think there is a lot. What, what business terms are we supposed to use here? More synergy. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of people. Is synergy coming back? <laughs> I know, exactly. It's terrible, right? It's the cringiest. Um, no, but I, I, I think you're right. I think it's spending more time in the pipeline together. I think, you know, that it's one of the second and third order effects. Like, you're going back to, you're going to ANS with SR and combat control and TACP, you know, dudes and dudettes. You're meeting those people. You're seeing them down at different schools. You know, I'm thankful to see <clears throat> how, uh, you know, I'm thankful to see how good the relationship here is between, you know, the controllers, TAC, PSR, like our, our deployment was great for that reason, because I think we are together a lot more and it is an unintended positive second order effect of, you know, I think putting everybody together in the pipeline and having them go through and then being more integrated in the squadrons and TAC P's are out there working at, you know, you know, guardian angel units out on the ACC side and uh, they're deploying with them, which is good. Like they've been asking for that forever. So that's, that's awesome. And it is good to see because I think we are way, way more effective as a, as a whole team. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> we are definitely in a different place now than we were 20 years ago when it comes to the integration of the, the kind of four primary um, aspect war career fields. But I think we're going to get to a point, and this is just my opinion. This is not the opinion of <laughs> of special yeah, tactics. Chapter marker like right here. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> I think we will get to a point where um, <laughs> where we go. Nope, I'm not going to say it. Nope. Just nope, not going to do yeah. it. I know what you guys are doing, and it, I don't like it. And I'm just we're saying. not going to go there. I'm just saying, just say it. Just don't, don't think about it. I, 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 would li- I would like to point out that <laughs> somebody, <laughs> yeah. Everybody I would does. like to point out that somebody wrote a white paper on a single beret color as well. So I thought about maybe bringing wow. that up, but I'm not going to. Wow. Um, That's what's, did everybody catch that deflection? Did you see, like, he, like, throws a smoke bomb over here, like, oh, well, well one break, huh? <laughs> nah, say what you were going to say. You're not going to distract us with that. No, but it was, okay, so, you know, combat controllers and PJs, at least on the special tech side, have been brothers and sisters for, for a long time, right? Um, there was, there used to be a lot of animosity between combat controllers and, and tech PJs, partly because we were both doing the JTAC mission and we were new to the JTAC mission. So there was, there was some animosity there. Um, but I, I, like I can tell you a lot of those guys that had that animosity are now gone. And then some of my best friends, some of my, like the guys that I look up to in the JTAC world are tech peas. I mean, they're just, they're, they're incredible. And they could, they can run circles around me. Um, 
which they should. That that is their primary job, and that's that is why we have brought them into special tactics. I mean, I challenge anybody to find a better JTAC than than somebody that's either at the weapon school or at the seventeenth special tactics squadron. Like, they they're not, and those yeah. dudes are incredibly professional. Um, I, like I don't even know what, what what ingredients they're using to make those dudes, but they are so professional. Um, it, it's just so we we have. Again, I know we've evolved, but um, we are definitely better together. And I know I, I think I just answered a message the other uh, last night, actually, on our DMs that and this was kind of going back to an episode that we had done a while back. But he, it's kind of a bummer that it's even a topic. He goes, hey, listen, I just be completely honest with me. I'm African-American and it doesn't seem like there's very many of you. Uh, you know, African Americans in aspect war, and I'm being told by by my own community, like, "Hey, you're you're not going to be accepted. You're not going to make it. You you may as well not even try." And that is so. There's a bunch of different ways to go with that that are mind blowing to me. But like, if you're thinking that, um, you know, you don't belong or you can't make it because of your cultural background your um color of your skin or your religion or something like that like get that out of your head because we want you like and i'm not talking about you know going with the political diversity thing but do you know what it makes america strong is the fact that we have so many people from so many different cultures and backgrounds that their strengths cover my weaknesses and my strengths cover their weaknesses so yeah, we want you, and you absolutely can make it. I, I just, I know I'm going off a tangent, but that, like, I got that message, and I just, I'm sitting here thinking, like, what world would I live in that somebody would think that, hey, I can't make this, or I shouldn't do this based off of something that... Well, it's my, it's if he was from package. Ohio, it would make more sense, you know? <laughs> Or if we were going, you know, educational based, if you're educated in South Carolina, I mean. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things. We, we all say it. You know, hey, because we get those DMs. Hey, have, has anybody ever, you know, it started off with, has anybody ever cross-trained from this career field? Or has anybody ever made it with this specific, you know, whatever? And we all say the same thing all the time. And it applies here. I don't know. Can you? I don't know, like, you know, if you DM me and you're like, I don't know if I can make it because of A, B, and C, I'm like, I don't know, can you? It's entirely up to you. And if you if you pass selection, guess what? You're a teammate. That's all. Like, come on. Come on in. We do we do not care. We nope. do not care. We just want you to pass selection and be safe when you operate on the job and be really, really good at your job. And that's it. So come on in. Yeah, I saw that message too, and it's, I always just laugh. You know, hey, is, has anybody ever done it with you know, a club foot and half a left arm. I don't know. I don't know. You want to be the first? Come on in. You can do it, fella. <laughs> that was so random. I, I was just, I'm trying to lighten the mood, buddy. I'm trying to get away. From uh, and let's talk, let's talk, talk about. Uh, Go ahead yeah, and hit up, uh, hit up your recruiter for medical requirements and get that screening out of the way before uh, you start asking these questions, gonna, please. Yeah. Gonna wanna, yeah, this is not medical advice. I should put that out there. <laughs> uh, precision strike, though. Let's let's hit on that since we're we're talking about the three. Oh, I know about precision strike. <laughs> Thank goodness, I'm glad you asked, Peaches. Yeah, Peaches, can you tell us about precision? Strike? Yeah, great. And the just want to talk about some of the advances in precision strike, but like it's wild, man. When you see some of the integration tools that they're using, when you you know some of the ways that they're using to communicate, it is it's one of those things where you it's you're proud of humanity. You're like, wait, we can do what now? Word? Yeah, I mean, oh, how, how smart are the people that came up with that and designed that stuff? You know, Unreal. those mesh networks Unreal. and stuff like that. And then you talk about like integrating from a little, you know, phone, right? Talking to planes, dropping points, you know, identifying targeting, providing all the targeting data that you could possibly need, and then executing. I mean, I I no longer have to take 10 minutes to pass a nine line, describe a target, get correlation, clear them. Before they even get into the area, I can already, they already know where they're hidden. Yep. And then they just get clearance and then done. I mean, it's With 3D from the ground imaging down to half a meter. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, 
Yeah. But I can't say much on Precision Strike in, the, in regards to that, because uh, what do you know? It's a lot of classified stuff, so. I was hoping we get number three. Yeah, no. Yeah, this is gonna, the title of this podcast is going to be the one where we get Peach and Spocker. And <laughs> yes. You're done. I'm working on it. Every day I work on it. Full time. <laughs> Every day I get a little bit closer. I mean, but the, the, but that brings us back. I think uh, as we get towards the end, I, I think one of the things we didn't talk about necessarily was was comms and how much those have changed. You know, like because when I first went, you know, showed up on team the the PSC five, Dama things like that. Those were things. God, that was a terrible radio. Yeah, and they were they were not very lightweight. Um, but you know, like and then now and it it seems like we've kind of come at least for SR right. We're coming full circle where. You know, satellite was so awesome for a long time, but now in the the next environment, you know, satellite might not be available. So we're kind of going back to our roots for some of the HF stuff and all that other things. So, I mean, I was just going to tie that into um, while the the old guys on team might not, um, you know, know everything. And while they may say things out of, uh, you know, experience or ego or whatever that might not apply to the young guys, there is a lot of knowledge, you know, as, as things circulate. Uh, that that they're gonna have that are gonna help you out, you know, during the uh, as we move from like high tech to low tech solutions and all these other things, and and integrating the stuff that the new guys are good at with some of the old school techniques as as a uh, we mesh all that stuff together and, and move forward. Yep, Peach, I do have one re- one request. Can we please go back to the one forty eight gem? Dang, that radio was the best radio on the face of the planet. Uh, you're not a fan of the one sixty three. How dare you? If I was going to fry an egg <laughs> on my kit, yes, it would be great. For, any, for was, anybody that doesn't understand gonna, that, it, it If I was going to find a hot. way to get so hot, it's so hot. I don't understand. Like, the memes are just, like, now coming out about, oh, you know, you get this hot lava brick that you wear. You no, that's for real, for real. Like, even the 152s didn't get that hot. You were just talking about being cold in the desert. You could just use that 163 was, just to kind of cuddle up. Yeah, on. it wasn't that hot in Africa, I'm pretty sure. Get out of here. Get out of here with the both of you. I have had it. I have I am up to here. Yeah. Well I did love that 148 though. That 148 uh, gem model. It was great. You could just cycle all the way through 15 channels. I don't know. <laughs> um Trent, before we wrap this up, I think one of the, the things that I didn't want to hit is just I at least want to acknowledge it. We don't have to go into detail about it, but I did want to acknowledge um you know, as we talk about the past conflict over the last 20 years, the amount of people um, that we have seen go from essentially zero to hero, like all of these decorated members, all of these incredible stories of, um, <laughs> you know, where people are just pinned down for hours on end and managed to come out on top because some miraculous decision or um like just some weird turn of events i mean some of these guys you know you you got your your you know john chapman your ivan ruiz is your your rob gutierrez is your barry crawford's i mean you just it goes on and on and on and it's not just based in aspect war i mean you're you're talking about across nsw usasak every you know marsock everybody they're have been incredible stories of heroism that I, I mean, just listening to the stories are, are incredible. And, um, though usually, you know, those stories are because something went wrong or maybe it was some bad planning. Those individuals were still able to overcome some adversity that, that most of the world will never know. So I, I just wanted to bring that up. Like I said, we don't have to get into any specifics, but um, I at least wanted to acknowledge that because, man, there has been some incredible stories out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I think we talked about that on, on the live the other day a little bit about, you know, when things go wrong and things go right. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I blame Intel most of the time for any time things go wrong. So that's why SR exists now is to plug those gaps. Intel and weather, those guys never know what they're talking about. But I mean, I, I think uh, one of the things I think we talk about all the time is is how important people are, right? And and as we get older, as at least as I get older, and I look back at the the last twenty years in Afghanistan or or Iraq or just my career in general, 
having the opportunity to be around these people and to be a part of the group that uh, saw these guys do these heroic things. And, and whether you heard about it or not, whether it led to an Air Force Cross or it led to a, a you know, a commendation medal or a bronze star, um, I don't think it makes that much of a difference to me. Um, but yeah, the, the community has been jobbing it for a long time and uh, doing incredible things. And, you know, like it might, it might sound weird when, when I say stuff like I wouldn't want to be part of any other community, like no offense to the army and the Navy and all those other folks. Um, but you know, like being part of this community is, is amazing. And I think we, uh, there's really nothing that, that is not possible with the, the group of individuals, with the people that we have. And, uh, it, it's nice to be part of a group that, you know, forces you to try hard every day to not embarrass yourself because everybody else is moving forward so fast. If you stop, you're out, you know? So, uh, yeah, Aaron. Yeah. Said perfectly, man. I don't want to over talk it. Uh, it's, it's the same reason that I love being in this career field. If you are not absolutely crushing it, you're going to get passed by and just left uh, on the wayside. And that's, that's one of the best things about it is you, you have to compete. You have to win. So yeah, well done. All right. Oh, um, good, good talk. I feel better. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's really, really, uh, really cathartic. Shout out to Cardomax again. Really appreciate those guys. Head over to Cardomax. Uh, is it Cardomax.com? Yeah. Is that the website? Hit them up on uh, IG and then hit that one's ready code up in the, uh, in the, the coupon code bar and get yourself a sweet discount. And let them say thanks to Cardomax again. Really appreciate the support. So. Yeah, and uh, make sure, like like we always say, hit up your recruiter. They have all the all the answers. There, you you know, there's no uh, contract until you sign a contract. So, uh, make sure you go through all that. If if you listen to this episode and for some reason you were inspired to join, which beyond me, um, go go hit those folks up. That's a red flag. That's a red flag. (laughs) If we if we inspired you to join, definitely a red flag. (laughs) Don't mention that. In the pre-site screening stuff, yeah. don't mention that. Yeah, that's like kind of automatic disqual. You're like, oh, you listen to these chuckleheads? You're out. Um, but shoes. Yeah. Also, head over to onesready.com uh, and, and look at our merch and, and all that stuff. We are going through some changes, but hopefully by the time this episode drops, uh, we have tons of sweet merch that you can go check out. Uh, Christmas is coming up, so don't be selfish. You know, spread the love around to your family and your friends. Uh, and I guess, well, yeah. We talked about everything, and we'll catch you all next time. Appreciate you listening. Later. Later.